This is the G.I. Joburg Review Team, and today we take a look at... The Thunderclap. G.I. Joe has got a lot of guns. Guns that are accurate. Guns that are excessive. Guns that belong. Guns that don't. Guns that make perfect sense. Guns that are just plain embarrassing. But there is a gun that stands alone as the biggest piece in the line. And that gun is mounted on the Thunderclap. That's right. The Thunderclap. Able to fire an 11 inch shell, the Thunderclap's Annihilator Cannon is in a class of its own. But it is a whole lot more than just a big gun. It's a self-propelled cannon that takes off to this. But doesn't need a stick to railways. With two tractor vehicles that double up as patrol cars when the cannon is fielded. It's a devastating three-prong weapon. <laughs> three-prong. <laughs> Supplementing the Annihilator Cannon, there are two 80mm guns mounted at the rear. And a surface-to-surface -surface missile launcher up front with three missiles. The forward and rear tractors are similarly armed with 80mm dual guns and three surface-to-surface -surface missiles apiece. The Thunderclap features a fascinating piece of technology. Mounted on the aft of the tractor vehicle, there is a low-noise, ultra-sensitive enemy radar jamming modulator. Huh. It's kind of like a secret boner. Combine this capability with the high degree of mobility that the Thunderclap has, and you have an artillery piece that can fire on a position and sufficiently evade counter-artillery fire by jamming enemy radar and repositioning. See, secret boner. The Thunderclap is not only G.I. Joe's largest gun, but paradoxically, also its sneakiest. This is a European release of the Thunderclap, and its box marks it as a 1990 release. Note that the box art differs from the American release. This measure was used, presumably, to exclude figures that were not part of the European assortment for that year. Ironically, however, all of the figures on the American Thunderclap box art are in the 1990 European assortment, so the new art is redundant. But it's nice to have new box art anyway. 1990 was when the Action Force banner was done away with altogether, so the stickers used on the vehicle freely say United States. So out of the box, this is every bit the same toy as the American release, except that the included operator, Long Range, is a Welshman. Now called David Evans and not Carl Fritz, he hails from Cardiff instead of Rhode Island. Only one other element of the file card is amended. The American file card boasts about Long Range being able to accurately fire a shell from Giant Stadium, New Jersey to Shea Stadium in New York. Well, the UK file card switches place names so that the Welsh Long Range can drop one on the goal mouth at Wembley Stadium from across London at Crystal Palace. Take your pick. But if you ask me, for whatever reason, I find his awesome blood red hair and beard to be kind of Welsh. Is that racist? In other news, with the Thunderclap being modelled on German trackborne artillery pieces of World War II, the American file card has an almost comically cliched German sounding name. Karl Fritz. I'll wager this is writer shorthand. It's common knowledge that Mr. G.I. Joe writer himself, Larry Harmer, kept track of rapidly multiplying casts of characters by using humour and word association. But I don't know if red hair was ever a hallmark of the master race. For a guy who operates G.I. Joe's largest gun, long range includes what I consider to be G.I. Joe's smallest gun. The Thunderclap and Long Range both debuted in the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero comic in November 1989. It's a good year. I can't remember half of it. Yeah. Long Range, Cross Country and Armadillo, who is called Rumbler, demonstrate the Thunderclap's capabilities to the Sierra Gordo military leadership. And convincingly use the gun to ward off an approaching force of demon tanks allowing a force of G.I. Joes to escape in the Warthog. 
The thunderclap features split apart action, and for a change, it's welcome. Flip down the four legs and drive the tow vehicles away. The tow vehicles are designed to fit in one orientation only. Try to switch them, and one post is too small to fit snugly, while the other post doesn't fit at all. Not sure how Mark Bellamo intended to connect his thunderclap in volume one of his guidebook. He's got the whole thing backwards. The barrel extends to its massive full length. Not a realistic feature, but it makes things nice and compact when it's retracted. Hell, if you don't like the retracting feature, you can keep it extended. Take someone's eye out with that thing. The cannon has a full 360 degrees of rotation and an excessive 170 degrees of elevation. So in still air, you can achieve the suicide trajectory. There is a lock and load feature that ejects the spent shell. It's a pity it couldn't fire the shell rather, like the Mega Marines APC of 1993, but it flips quite convincingly, and it's a sturdy mechanism. There are of course only four shells, but you can imagine there is more ammunition in the cavity under the gun. This launcher also boasts a high degree of rotation and elevation. It's also thermal protected according to the blueprints. Good thing too. Otherwise these guys get a face for the back blast, and I don't mean him. The tractor and trailer vehicles are both nicely constructed and uniquely designed. They have their own stickers and excellent exterior and interior sculpting. I'd say their designs are stronger than the cannon portion. The front vehicle features a removable engine cover for its massive engine. The rear vehicle features six rolling wheels. An elevating missile rack. A long range combo antenna. Its construction allows the top chassis to rotate a full 360. And it has brake lights and indicators. You know, to obey the rules of the road. Too bad there are no headlights. The missiles on the tractor, trailer and cannon portion are all unique sculpts. They didn't have to be, but it's a nice touch. I have five criticisms of the Thunderclap. Number one. The tractor vehicle has very little ground clearance. As with the Hiss tank, this is a toy design fault to allow for the dumbbell wheel placement. But unlike the Hiss, there is actual mechanical detail molded down there further reducing the clearance. These two points in particular are carpet snaggers. Play with your thunderclap on a rough surface like concrete and you're likely to grind them away altogether. Which might actually not be such a bad idea. Come to think of it, the cannon portion doesn't get raised terribly high off the ground either. Kind of limits the type of terrain this thing can handle. Crit number two. The figure seats on the cannon unit have no floor at all. So your figure's legs dangle like they were the cast from the Flintstones. That's kind of cheap. Number three. The gun chair. Who the hell thought this was a good idea? What artillery piece in the world has such a feature? The answer? None. When this thing goes off, you do not want to be in contact with the barrel. The solitary seat belt on this puppy has got to be the most hard-working black belt in the G.I. Joe toy line, to keep the body of a Joe from being flung 10 feet into the air. But regardless, the trauma to your organs caused by the violent shock will likely send you to your maker. Number four, the loader area. It's not sufficient. I assume the shells are meant to be fed into the rear of the gun, but the back wall makes this awkward at best. I would have preferred losing the two rear seats. What are they for anyway? Controlling these guns? In that case, I would prefer the guns to be manually operated. They seem to be designed with scopes and shoulder rests anyway. Just slap a handle on the side and there you go. And finally, number five, the trailer vehicle canopy. If your figure is seated upright, closing the canopy is an impossibility. You have to make the figure scooch down rather unrealistically, to the point where the seatbelt becomes useless. 
his hands cannot be posed realistically on the controls, you may as well have left him out and pretend he's comfortably seated in there. But in spite of these criticisms, I can safely say the Thunderclap is the one must-have toy of the 1989 series. It has a very practical and real-world function, one that only two or three G.I. Joe toys and one Cobra fulfilled before. She's got a ton of firepower and features and a Welshman with a curiously small pistol. This has been G.I. Joburg's review of the Thunderclap. Now get up and shell somebody!